Well, thank you to all of our worship team and, and uh, volunteers and leaders for bringing us to the throne of God and uh, uh, helping us with our, our worship. Um, I'd like to offer a prayer as well right now as I begin to share the message. Heavenly Father, um, I just pray for your anointing, Lord. I pray that your voice would be heard in this place, that hearts would hear your message, and that we would be changed and we would be blessed from the time that we spend together. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we are going to experience a little bit of a roller coaster as a church between this week and next week, just so you know, this is again a, a little bit of a, um, uh, an ad announcement. Um, next week, um, the school is doing the church service. So they have a week of prayer coming up, and then they usually cap off that week of prayer by uh, having the service. I don't know if Pastor uh, Mike Soto will be doing that or not. Uh, we will see, um, but uh, it's going to be a different experience. I also wanted to mention, and, and just so that you can be praying about that and looking forward to um, uh, having a lot more uh, of the young people participating in worship next week. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is last month, uh, I spent uh, the Sabbath that we had together uh, going through the three angels' messages, and I just wanted to mention, even though uh, I could spend a lot more time on that, and we could just, that is a, a series of, of lessons and a passage of the Bible that there's, there's no depth, I mean, there's no end to the depth that you can delve into uh, such critical um, uh, parts of Scripture, and uh, they're so foundational to who we are as a people um, so even though uh, there's more that could be said, there's more that, that should be studied, I would just invite you, if you heard some of those messages, if you heard one of them, you heard them all, don't end your own personal journey with studying them because I think it is a valuable uh, experience to be reminded and to continue developing uh, that pivotal uh, passage of Scripture for us in these last days. So my message today is uh, kind of related to the social event that we have going on today, the guest who's coming for... Are we calling it dinner or lunch? You know, I grew, up, I, I grew up not knowing what to call the meal after church. Grandma called it supper. Mom and dad called it dinner. But the rest of the week, dinner was in the evening. So to me, it was lunch. Um, so I, I don't know. Whatever you call the, 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 the meal after services, uh, guess who's coming to that meal is what is happening. So my, my message is somewhat related to, to that and, and uh, some of the blessings of, of how uh, we can experience God in those types of contexts. So now, obviously, um, we are also in a different kind of situation with very few young people here. So I, for those of you who are visitors or guests, I have a tradition of always having an interactive portion to the beginning of my message. It's a kid's quiz. The kids are all out there. You see them right there doing very spiritual, holy things right now. And um, uh, so when the kids aren't here, I shift it to a teen trivia, but most of our teens are gone here, so I'm just making this kind of an open-ended uh, response time to get us flowing in the, in the thought of the message today. It all comes down to where or what is God's house. When you think in the Bible, and I, I hope it's okay um, if you want to participate, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and we won't do the whole roving mic this one time, if that's okay. Um, but think about this question for a minute. Where or what in the Bible is God's house? Or where does He dwell? Where does He tell us He lives? And when you think about it, there's a lot of answers to this. We're not going to take all morning or the rest of the morning going through this, but there's some obvious ones, and that's fine, and there's going to be some ones that are a little more uh, um, philosophical or whatever, but anyone want to just raise your hand and say, I think I know one thing that is God's house. Is that Vanessa? Yeah, Vanessa. Oh, in your heart. Okay, yeah, that's right. The Bible says that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, so God dwells in us. Very good. Anyone else? Yeah, Dennis. Oh, I almost called you Dennis. Derek. The tabernacle. Okay, that's one of the more practical, physical structures God talked about, that that would be his house. Anything else? Where else does God? Okay, Carlos. 
All right, he says that when we gather, he, we, he dwells among us. We become a tabernacle. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, did he steal your answer? Oh, Heaven, yeah, again, I'm not trying to be tricky here. Uh, God says He dwells in heaven, that heaven is His house. Heaven's where He lives. Have we gotten all of them, or are there any more? Where does God live? Where is God's house? Sarah. Okay, the church, meaning the building, or meaning the people? The people. The people, the people. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Now, is that all of them? Not everyone likes to, to raise their hand to be called upon. I get it. This is an interesting question. Where is God's house? Everyone needs to have a house. You know, the president has a house. It's called the White House, right? And it's a symbol. The governor has the governor's mansion. That's, that's kind of a symbolic thing. That's where they are at. That's where we know we can go and find them, at least, you know, symbolically or theoretically. God also decided that he wanted to have a house or wanted us to understand where he dwells. And that's kind of getting into, oh yeah, Evelini. In our house? Oh, very interesting. Did you look at my notes? All right, look. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, let's just, let, let me, thank you for those of you that were bold and brave and decided to, to, to help us. I just want to, to uh, go through this just a little bit. Obviously, in the Old Testament, the most physical, practical structure that God instructed the people to build was the temple or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sanctuary. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they were living in tents, and God said, I want a tent too. I don't want to be left out of this. Please make me a tent because I want to live with you. That will be my house. And so they built the, the sanctuary. That was physically, literally a, a manifestation of God saying, I'm going to live in your midst. When they began to settle and establish the nation of Israel, they began to build houses with stone and, and permanency. So God said, guess what? I want one of those too. I want a permanent structure, no longer a tent. Build me a permanent structure. That will be my my house. And so they built the temple, and the temple was the house of God. Those were the most practical, physical uh, things. You could look at them and see them. You could touch them. You could go there and have the promise that God was there, and that was very powerful and significant and symbolic. However, the Old Testament also acknowledges uh, that, that that wasn't the only limit to God's dwelling. Um, Solomon, when he dedicates the temple and he's giving this magnificent prayer, he says, there's no way that this house that I built you is sufficient. There's no way that this house can contain you. And he makes this statement in 1 Kings. He says, even the highest heaven cannot contain you, let alone this small little house that I've built you. So within the Old Testament, they realize this, this uh, compliment and this, this paradox that God dwells everywhere, He's everywhere, but yet he also has this practical reality of dwelling in our midst in the temple. And then very interesting, and this is a, a beautiful reality that's much better developed in the Old Testament than the New, the idea that God dwells in eternity. He is not bound by time. He lives in the past, present, and future. He actually lives in an eternal context. And again, that's very ethereal and philosophical, but you have this beautiful complement in the Old Testament between the very practical house of God that you can walk into, you can touch and feel, and then you have the greatness and the grandeur of God in the heavens and in eternity. In the New Testament, things shift a little. The, the temple had always been a symbol, a very powerful, very significant, very real symbol, but now the temple has shifted to the people as we have mentioned here. The community becomes the living temple, and there's lots of terms, the assembly, the community, the brethren, the church, the living temple. We now know that when we assemble, when we gather, or when we are of like belief, God promises that He dwells in our midst. That means right here, right now, God is here, that this is His house, this is His temple. In this very room, just as serious and practical and real as the physical structure of the temple was, this very real and practical and physical reality is the promised house, the promised dwelling place of God. God is here in our midst, amen? 
And, and this is why in, in times past, I've, I've encouraged, and it's part of a lot of our, our understanding as believers, it's, it's talked about among pathfinders. One of the pathfinder codes, I was not a pathfinder, so I don't know all of the little codes, but isn't one of them walk softly in the... Why? Why? Why should we walk softly in the sanctuary? Because it's rude to stomp? It's about acknowledging the very real promise of God that when we come into this place that has been dedicated and sanctified, and when we assemble, that the promise of God's presence is here. So it is a sacred thing. It's a real thing. And we should always have that respect and recognition that this is a place where God dwells. So I'm, I'm waxing eloquent. But the New Testament also does not deny or, or contradict all the, that God is, still has his house in heaven. And Jesus says that in John 14. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions, and I'm going there. He identifies that God is at his home in heaven as well. So God is everywhere. It's consistent with the Old Testament. And then... Um, uh, uh, where the Old Testament does a better job identifying the eternity of God and the greatness and grandeur, I think the New Testament does a better job of identifying the personal dwelling of God in each and every human heart. That, that we, in our bodies, are a living temple, individually. Now, I don't remember if any of you remember this. Oh, that was said weird. I don't know if any of you remember this like I remember it, but I remember being like 10 years old, in a, in, a, in a church class, and the teacher's saying, now, boys and girls, remember, God wants to set up his throne in the throne, or set up his throne in your heart. You remember that? And I, I'm just being honest with you, in my mind's eye as a 10, 11-year-old, I saw this itty-bitty throne. And I think the movie, Honey, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, had just come out. And I pictured God, shrinky, 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 and going and sitting on that throne. And again, I wasn't trying to make any, I wasn't joking about it. I was just trying to understand what they meant by that, that God wants to sit upon the throne of my heart. And, uh, you know, as a kid, you're just trying to process it. But it, it really, in a very serious way, God promises He wants to dwell in us. He wants to live in our hearts, in our minds. As much as we love our children and we, we, we consider our spouse and they're in our hearts, they're in our minds at all times. God can do that at an even greater level. So all of these, and there's more than these, by the way, lots of different ways that God expresses where He lives and how He dwells and, and the eternity of God, but also the person of God and the personality of God that He wants to dwell in us and with us. And, and we could go into that to a large degree. Most of the time today, though, when you think of the house of the Lord, and we sing about that, there's joy in the house of the Lord, right? Um, we were talking about this structure, and most people often think of the house of God as the building. And by the way, that's not wrong. If we limit it to that, um, yeah, that's a problem because uh, it's more than that. But this is a place that we've dedicated and sanctified. This is a house of God. We've invited God to live here. But it really only serves as that function when we gather in it, right? And as we, we continue to maintain that sanctification and dedication. So I don't have a Bible verse with that because there really is no Bible verse that talks about the building being the house of God in a New Testament context. But I think the, the, uh, the, the idea behind it is fine. It, it can go the wrong way, but Evelini, you took my thunder. <laughs> this is where I want to go. What about your house? Your, your, not like your body, your tent, you're not, not that. Your physical house. Is that God's house? Does God want it to be His house? Do you want it to be God's house? You know, in American culture, uh, in many uh, cultures, it's not just in America, but, but uh, uh, other cultures are slightly more communal, we're more individualized here, there's a, a very real uh, thing that we do for, for good reasons, um, but, but if we apply it to our faith, it can be bad. We compartmentalize things, and we keep, like, like work, we keep work at work, right? We don't want to bring work home because we want to keep work at work. If we bring work home, then what's the point of home? Home is supposed to be a refuge, 
Okay, home is supposed to be where you separate from work. So we try, we're not always successful, but we try to say that's for the office, that's at work, now I'm home, and that's different, and, and we're not going to... And, and the same goes the other way. We try to keep home at home and don't bring it to work. If, if my, my wife is a nurse, and, and if she was in the middle of putting an IV in, and I call her and I say, honey, I can't run the oven, what do I do? Do you hit pre, preheat first, or do you have to turn the dial? I'm just lost. Honey, help me with the oven! and she's in the middle of an IV, it, it would be wrong of her to, sit, to, to, to kind of be on the phone going, well, first you got to turn the dial, and then, and, you know, that patient would be like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, you got to keep, and there's emergencies and all that. I'm not trying to be uh, um, extreme here, but we keep home at home, and we keep work at work, right? We try to. We need to understand that there's a separation between that. But sometimes we do the same thing with the church. We keep the church in the church, and we keep it separate from the home. We keep it separate from the hobbies. We keep it separate from uh, the other things that we do. And, and it, we, we feel that that's important for a variety of reasons. But I'm just here to ask the question, is that, is that healthy? Is that what we should do? Or, or is there a different reality when it comes to our faith and our extension of God's house, including our house. And I, I'll just share with you, I, I listen to the songs that we sing, not just today, but, you know, uh, uh, throughout history, even, you know, the hymns and things like that. And sometimes I wonder what we think when we sing them. Any of you ever sang, I surrender all, and, and it just feels so spiritual, I surrender all, it's all I surrender. Do you mean it? Or is it, I surrender all except the Seahawks, God. I can't surrender the Seahawks. They've got to win or else it's, it's a rough day for me. I surrender all except my taxes. <laughs> no, I can't give that. That's, that's rough. Or do we mean it? And it's just a moment to invite the question, is your house God's house? Is your apartment God's apartment is your room. If, uh, again, if you're a dorm student, I had that in mind when I wrote this, but some people rent rooms. And I, is the place where you dwell a dedicated place where also God dwells? And, and this isn't meant to be, now, now we can simplify this and say, well, obviously if God's in me and I love the Lord, then when I walk in, then yes, it's God with me and I do it. But I'm trying to look at this not so much at the, the, the spiritual side of it, but very pragmatic, very practical. Is your home God's home? And, and again, we, we, we could go a lot of different directions from this. My title comes from Joshua, it's an Old Testament, where Joshua challenges the children of Israel um, to make a decision about how they're going to orient their lives and whether they're going to serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable to serve the Lord, choose yourselves whom you're going to serve. But he makes this you know, statement that we love and we, we, we see it and we know it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, again, he's talking about his family, you know, uh, being obedient to God. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm reducing this to the, the literal physical question of his house. Now, I, I'm trying not to give you whiplash, but I want to apply this to a New Testament context, though. And look at how the early church applied this idea of their home being God's house, the home being an extension of God's house. And I know some of you have heard this before, studied this before, and, and by the way, maybe a disclaimer um, right here at the beginning. There is an entire uh, uh, curriculum of something called the house church, the house church. And there's pros and cons to every model, and that's fine. I don't, uh, you know, house church, simple church, cell church, small church, there's all these different models, and there's, there's good things about those, but that's not really what I'm talking about today in case your mind is going there, and there's, there's, there's good things to look into that. Um, I'm looking at it from a more general perspective. You all know this passage, though. We're just going to briefly look at these verses here in Acts. Acts chapter 2, uh, you're probably familiar uh, with some of these stories that we're looking at. The God has just done a powerful thing. Peter has preached a powerful sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost. Jews from all nations of the world are listening, and their, their, their hearts are churned, and they, they want to accept what, what Peter has said. And it says here in Acts 2, verse 41 and following, Then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. This is kind of considered the birthplace or the birthday of the modern Christian church. 
didn't really have that terminology and title. They were still largely thinking of themselves as Jews and things like that. But this is really the, the, the first Jesus has ascended to heaven, okay? And they are now becoming a newly identified movement that would eventually be called the Christian movement or the Christian church. And this is really the birthday. This is the birth point of this movement. The day of Pentecost, the ingathering it's called. It goes from a handful of disciples waving goodbye to Jesus as He ascends to the 120 um, who gather in the upper room in Acts chapter 1, and now all of a sudden you have 3,000 more believers joining this movement. Okay? It's wonderful. It's very evangelistic. It's very powerful. Wish that we could all preach as Peter and, and 3,000 would raise their hand and say, yes, I want to I wanna accept Jesus. But it's what comes after this that is instructive for us today. Verse 42, they, these 3,000, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. All those who had believed were together. They had things in common. They had all things in common. They began selling property, possessions, and were sharing them as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one, with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So in a very short few verses, Luke here, the author, is giving a very profound a statement about the beauty of what God was doing in the community at this time. They had received the Lord, they had received the word of Peter, and they've become so bonded together as a community, they become so trusting together as a community that they become like one big family. Isn't this how you describe a family? Did, did you hear the verses that were read? They were devoted to each other. They were breaking bread with each other. They were praying together. They saw many wonders and signs together. They believed together. They had all things in common together. They shared possessions together. They were continuing in one mind together in the temple. They were going from house to house together. Doesn't that sound like a family? It's a pretty beautiful description of commonality and and humility and grace. It's something that we rarely experience today, even in, in families. the the strife and bitterness and division that can sometimes creep in even to the community of faith. But for one brief moment in time, the Christian church blossomed in this power of the Holy Spirit overcoming people. But you obviously see the part that I'm getting at. Where did those 3,000 people go? Did they go to the arena? Did they go to uh, the footprint center? Where did those 3,000 people go? They went home. They went to their homes, and it was through the ministry of opening up their homes to the work of God that the family dynamic was strengthened, and the church, Luke says, that the, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, you could say to yourself, well, this isn't really fair. I mean, the church was brand new. It's not like they could go out and buy the materials and just build the building. They had meeting halls back then. They met in meeting halls back then, too. The upper room was a meeting hall, okay? It was a room, but there was 120 in that room, okay? It was a community meeting hall. There were schools of the rabbis. There were schools of philosophy. There were workers' guilds. There were all kinds of of, of meeting places that they could have rented, they could have built. But the early chapters of the Bible, going clear throughout the New Testament, it was the reality of God dwelling in the home that sprung the Christian church in, in, in its successful beginning years. We don't even have, historically, the first church building that we know of that we believe exists, does, isn't found till over 200 years later. Around the year 250 is the first structure we think may have been the first church building. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be derogatory about the fact that we have structures that we assemble in and that we love. What I'm trying to do is express that we need to have a balance between the joint assembling of the, the, the believers together in the household of God and the extension of that work even into our very home. So I'm just going to look at these other verses with you briefly. I know that you um, have read the book of Acts before. 
Acts 5, 42, it says, very similar to Acts chapter 2, day by day and in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. When Saul wanted to persecute the church, where did he find the church? Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, that's the next verse. Paul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging them off, and he would put them into prison. Where did he find the church? It was in homes. It was in homes because that's where the church was born. That's where the church began. That's where the church thrived and grew. And again, it's not to say they didn't have their joint assemblies. It says that they would gather together at the temple. They would gather together at the riverside to pray. They would gather together in the city town or the agora to have meetings. It's not about an either or. It's about extending and re-establishing the blessings and benefits of not having that compartmentalized life of saying, uh, the church is for the church. I pray in the church. I give in the church. I sing in the church. But at home, it's totally different. At home, I don't see it that way. And I'm inviting you to open up your mind a little bit and consider the reality and the biblical benefits of considering your home, wherever your home is, as God's home. And what does that mean? I love this one in Acts chapter 16. It's the Philippian jailer um, and the conversion of his family. But just look at these verses here in Acts 16. I'll, I'll read them, verses 31 to 34. Um, so, so Paul and Silas have just been let out of prison, and the earthquake has come. It says, uh, and the jailer uh, was scared. Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus. You will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him there with all who were in his house. Where did they go? To his house. And he took them that very hour in the night, washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Time and time and time. And this is just a few verses. There's a dozen or more in Acts that, that illustrates the role of the home, the role of the home as God's house, as a place where God does great things. He does great things in the assembly of the believers too, but He needs to have uh, more opportunities to develop character and to establish our Christian walk. And the role of our house is one of those. Notice these verses, again, just throughout the New Testament. Greet the church that is in their house. Where's the church? It's in their house. 1 Corinthians, Aquila and Prisca, greet you heartily in the Lord and the church that's in their house. Colossians, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that's in their house or in her house. Last one, Philemon 2, and to, uh, to Aphia, and sis, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. House Again, the idea of, of, of the church was completely uh, uh, inclusive of the idea of the community of believers worshiping in homes, in houses. They had other opportunities, and there were other opportunities to meet in, in, uh, in group settings and buildings such as what we would call a church, but they didn't think of it in that way. They thought of it as more of an expression of the home. This is from the commentary. In a day when Christians did not own church buildings, the thought that God was nevertheless in their midst, both personally and collectively, was profoundly reassuring. A building cannot reflect a living God, but a converted Christian can. A converted Christian convinces people of a living God, not just a building, not a building. Thus, God's church is primarily the spiritual union of all its converted membership, whether worshiping in the same room or even separated by great distances. The early church thrived when believers made their homes an extension of God's house. There's just, there's no getting around it. And you say, but that was a different time. That was a different culture. Now we have scammers and we have, the, we've got to put locks on the doors and what about this and that? And again, I don't want to race to extremes. I'm just trying to invite you to this very simple question. Is your house, is your apartment is the room that you rent, have you dedicated it to God? Have you made it God's house? And allow the Holy Spirit to direct you in how that applies 
to not only your life, but to the extension of the work of God that He wants to do in the church. How do we get to know each other? I didn't include this in my sermon. This is, this is a side note, just so you know, a little bit of a rabbit trail. How do you get to know people? You spend time with them, right? We spend a few hours together, beautiful, lovely hours together on Sabbath. Love it. Sometimes we have potluck. You know, sometimes we have other things. Uh, but we're quite busy when we gather together. We have our, our classes. We have our programs. Uh, we have our corporate things that we do. We don't have that much time on Sabbath now, some churches are very active. They go to church all day, and they have all kinds of afternoon things, and, and they do things differently, uh, and that's fine. But how do you get to know people? How do you get to know God's people? You've got to spend time with them. And having more opportunities to do that in your home is where that's going to be possible and probably more effective. And, and I'll talk about that more in just a second. It seemed only natural to the early church. It seemed only natural that their homes would be the place where God would do His work. Is your house God's house? On a personal note, do you engage in worship practices in your home, devotions, worship, prayers? Do you have a Bible that is familiar to you, that's accessible to you? Or is it something you only do when you come on Sabbath? And I, again, I, I'm not trying to poke you in the eye here. I'm just asking a very serious question as, as the pastor. Is your home life consistent with your faith? I, I, I probably shared this story before. I was working with a pastor. Actually, Oli was just here a couple weeks ago. Oli and Vonnie, one of the first pastors I worked with coming out of college. And he got this, this crazy idea that he wanted he, him and I to visit every member of the church in the month of February. And it was a large church. There was over 400 people on the books. And we were going to visit every home. And so we got big charts together, and we were scheduling things. We got the secretary involved. The sad thing that we found is that 60% of the church members, I shouldn't be saying this. Oh, how much time has to pass before you get yourself in trouble? 60% uh, of the church members said, we don't want you in our home. Now, they didn't come right out and say it like that, Emily. They didn't, yeah, we don't want you in your home. But they, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, well, you know, the, I haven't vacuumed, you know, and the, you might see, ah, uh, uh, uh. But it's a question. Is your home life a place where you're proud of your walk with God? Or when your Christian friends come over, do you got to put the rated R movies aside? Do you got to pull the bacon out of the fridge and hide it? <laughs> Is your house God's house? And are you open to your house being an extension of God's work? Um, I want to tell a story. I've been sharing some testimonies here recently. Um, so again, just to, some of you have heard me share about how I, my wife and I joined the church. And before we ever walked into a Seventh-day Adventist church, I had been studying with a friend at work. And the time came where Ron said to me, you know, it seems like you really want to study this more. Would you like to come to a Bible study? And um, we were at Costco together, and I was like, well, I, I guess, yeah, we really need to spend more time on this because, um, you know, we can't talk in depth while we're, you know, at work as much. He says, well, let's do that. He says, I'm part of a weekly Bible study. Um, it's at Dr. Sloop's house, and he's one of the elders of the church. Now, I just want to point out a couple of things to you. I did not grow up with the term elder being part of my religious experience. A lot of churches have retired the term elder, kind of like we've retired apostle and bishop and things like that. So the term elder, the only spiritual context I could think of as elders was Mormons. Because, you know, they show up at your door with the white shirt and the black tie and they say, hi, I'm elder, I'm elder Thompson, I'm elder so-and-so, and you're looking at this 18-year-old kid going, okay, elder. <laughs> um, but that's the only association. So elder was not part of my, my Christian thinking. It was, it was like elder. I, I'm not accustomed to that. And then when he said it's doctor, too, I grew up very blue-collar. The only doctors I interacted with were in a very professional environment, you know, someone that you had to get a physical for so you could go play baseball, and, and it was always very formal and official. And I was like, so I'm going to go to an elder's home and a doctor's home? That seems scary. <clears throat> Still is. No. Uh, but I talked with Gina, and we said, yeah, we probably need to, we need to spend this time because we're on a journey. We feel God is leading us. So we told Ron, yes, we'll go to Dr. Sloop's house. Do you remember this? 
We're, we're going to see how much we remember together. It's been a while. But here's, here, here's what happened in, in my experience. So um, the, the day comes, and we drive up to a house, nice house, um, and uh, surrounded by an orchard and very lovely. And we walk up to the door, and again, when you hear elder and doctor in your head, your mind fills with an image. You, you, you anticipate something on the other side of that door. And uh, ring the doorbell or whatever, and Rick Sloop opens the door, and uh, it wasn't what I expected. He, he, and he's a neurologist. He's a fine man, beautiful uh, mentor of mine, and I, I, I love him to death. Uh, but he's a slightly built man, um, and he was not in a suit and tie and shiny shoes and a white coat and all that, you know. He was in casual. He was in jeans and a shirt, but I'll never forget his socks. He was wearing these orange, argyle, goofy-looking socks. And I don't know why, but seeing those socks on an elder and a doctor made me relax. He's normal. And I know I've forgotten some of the family, Brian and Lori and Doug and, and Denise and Rick and Linda. And, um, and we sit down there, and we are just, I'm still just petrified. These are weird people. They do weird things like don't eat meat, and, and uh, um, this was all radically new, but I was trying to study the Bible. But we sit down, and I remember them passing around a bowl of popcorn. Now, this was not popcorn I've ever had in my life. It was Adventist popcorn. <laughs> it did not have butter on it. It did not have salt on it or cheese. It had olive oil and something called brewer's yeast. And it was strange. Never had brew. And I don't remember ever eating it, anything like that. So I'm eating it going, Adventist popcorn. <laughs> but we were snacking together in a home. And then I'll, I'll just, I, it's just weird the things that stick out to you. There's, there's sofas and chairs and stuff. But Rick sits down. He was kind of the leader of the Bible study. He sits down on a rocking chair. And he's just rocking. <laughs> okay, guys, let's break out our Bibles. We're in Daniel chapter 3 right now. And he is just comfortable. And it made me comfortable. We were in our socks together. We were eating funky popcorn. And we were rocking out. Now, I can't say why all these things happen and why they stick out to me, but if it hadn't been for that person opening up their home and making it a safe, comfortable environment, if it had been, my, if my only option at that time had been go to the Seventh-day Adventist church, walk through the doors and just see what happens. Now, God can work. Don't get me wrong. God can and I pray that everyone that walks through the doors of the church has a blessed, holy experience. But it's, it's a blessing when we have more opportunities. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? God used a home to develop our faith. God used a small community that had opened up their home and opened up an opportunity for us to explore in a safe, comfortable environment things that were at that time rocking our world. And I thank God that that happened in our walk, in our life. And I could go through more stories, and from time to time you'll hear more about those early experiences. I believe that as we get going in our church, as we get going in our discipleship and our dynamics, the more we can see the work of God in our homes, the more growth, the more stability, the more fellowship, and the stronger we will be as a church community. Now, why does it matter? And I'm, I'm wrapping it up here just so you know. First of all, it's biblical. It just is. The, the, the New Testament is filled with the stories of people growing, discipling, evangeling, evangelizing, worshiping in their lives homes. So it's biblical. Whatever we may think about it, we need to explore how that applies to us. Secondly, 
I think the home, just as important as Sabbath school is, just as important as the worship service is, just as important as Pathfinders is or the midweek worship meeting, I think that there's a component to discipleship that can only happen in the home. There's a component to growth that can only happen in the home. Right now, right now, I'm Pastor Dave. I have a jacket on. I'm on a platform. I have a microphone. And you see me through that lens. And I'm not ashamed of that lens. I pray God uses that lens to bless you. But when I go home, the microphone comes off, guys. The jacket, it comes off, Edwin. The shoes get kicked off, I'm in my socks, and I'm no longer Pastor Dave, I'm Gina's husband, I'm Bailey, Timry, and Toby's dad, I'm Dave Lounsbury, I'm in my home, and I will relate to you differently in my home, not because I'm different, not because I'm a hypocrite, but because I'm home. If you ask someone to your home, they know you as church member who sits over here, or they know you as Sabbath school teacher who wears that same tie every week, right? They know you as Eva who leads us in worship with beautiful music and guitar, and that's fine. But you see another side of people when you're at home. So it is an important part of discipleship and evangelism. And finally, Where will we go in the last days, friends? Do you really think churches will just be open and and safe refuges right up until the day that Jesus comes back and says, I'm ready to take you home? Have you read the book of Revelation? The home today will become the last refuge of the church tomorrow. I want to end with the story. Uh, I got this from a missionary who uh, told it to our church years ago. In the 1940s and 50s, the communist takeover of Eastern Europe and of the Soviet bloc was quite severe. And in the country of Romania, the communist government was very skeptical, and all communist government was always skeptical of the church. They would only allow religion insofar as they could control it. And in Romania, they were, comp- they were quite... Um, quite severe, as they were in other places. The government said, if we cannot dictate to you what you teach and believe, we will shut you down. Well, of course, many believers said, we don't abide by that. We're going to continue to meet in secret. The government said, if you do that and we catch you, you could be executed. They, they arrested and imprisoned, imprisoned tens of thousands during this time in Romania. Um, and this was a Romanian that was, was telling me the story. That's why it comes from Romania. But in in the 1950s, there was a group of Christians who said, we will not abide by what we're being told. We will not live under the the communist idea of what we're allowed to do in worship, so we're going to meet secretly in homes. And so one group of believers went in a home, and it was quiet, it was secret, it wasn't allowed uh, uh, by the government, and they knew that the government had said, uh, you could be executed for doing this. So they're having their meeting, and they're singing, they're reading, and uh, uh, they're, they're having their worship service when all of a sudden, two soldiers crash through the door, slam the door open. They have their uniforms on, helmets, they have guns, and they point the guns at them, and they say, you know what you're doing is illegal. If you don't want to die, if you're not ready to die for Jesus, you better leave now. Well, a couple of them, kind of in shock and disbelief, got up and left. They made the uh, announcement again, okay, anyone else, if you're not ready to die for Jesus right now, you better leave. A few more gathered their things, maybe grabbed a child, you know, not sure what to do, and they left. The soldier said, anyone else? If you're not ready to die for Jesus, anyone else? The rest were sitting there silently praying to themselves, trying to whisper words of encouragement to one another. And when finally no one else left, one of the soldiers turned around and closed the door. Then they both took off their helmets, sat down their guns, and said, we also are believers in Jesus. But we had to make sure there were no spies or people here, because if it was found out 
that we were worshiping with you, we would die. So we had to tell anyone not ready to die for Jesus to leave. But now we're ready to worship with you because we are willing to die for Jesus also. That wasn't that long ago. The opening of homes preserved the faithful in times of great trial and persecution. Let's make our homes now a place that is God's house. Let's make our homes an extension of God's work. Pray about it, however He leads you. I'm not saying you have to start a house church. I'm not saying you have to do any of that. But how is God speaking to you about making your house His house? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't always have all the answers. We haven't always thought things through to their completion. But God, I just pray that in the development of our journey and our faith, not only for the benefit of our families, our our immediate families, that we know we've dedicated our hearts to You and, and we've dedicated our families and our homes to You, But Lord, we see such a beautiful tapestry of stories throughout the New Testament where you did powerful things working through individual lives, individual homes, and establishing and building the powerful church that we all benefit from even today. Lord, we know that you're doing great things here in the Scottsdale Church. You are growing and blessing and doing powerful things. But Lord, we know that there's an opportunity for us to grow closer together and to establish our faith even stronger as we commune in homes and as we relate to one another in settings that are not simply in the church. We love the church too, Father, and we're so grateful for it. We just want to see further development and growth of our faith. So help us, Father, as we explore this. Bless the leaders of the church as we try to uh, craft ideas and make opportunities for expressions of showing that our house is also your house. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you all so much for being here, and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath.